Defaulting on our debt is not an option. Not an option. It will have catastrophic consequences. Breaking news coming out in the past 48 hours that the next pandemic is already on the way. And we will have a recession running perhaps deep into next year. In a single night, the Israeli military attacked 750 Hamas and Hezbollah sites. Across the country, states are trying to tackle the growing mental health crisis. Well, could the next pandemic make the height of the COVID-19 outbreak look mild? Many of you have heard me tell my story, or at least parts of it. Growing up, I was a misfit, uh, a nerd, whatever you want to call it. I looked the part, and I don't like to admit it, but I, I kind of acted the part. I was smart, I made good grades, and I always had a book with me. When other kids were talking or goofing off, I was reading. Now, I'm glad for that because I am an absolute fount of useless knowledge with all my random facts, still not good at Trivial Pursuit because don't watch movies or TV, but lots of random facts, which completely don't impress other seventh graders. I wasn't popular, cool, or even halfway there. I was the one who was picked on, made fun of, and it hurt. Over 40 years later, I still remember the things people said and the names they called. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it seems ridiculous that I'm able to remember that this much later. I can't even remember where I put my keys. But those moments stuck with me. Maybe you identify. Have you ever been in a situation where you were the misfit? Where you didn't quite fit? Maybe it was one of those events where you didn't get the invitation and everyone else was dressed formal and you were in jeans and a t-shirt. Or especially this week, a lot of you can identify with this one. Uh, growing up, was there a kid's table at your family get-togethers? That was fun when you were five or six, because you could get away with more and not eat cauliflower. But when you get older and you still have to sit at the kid's table, you feel like a horrible loser. Or have you ever been the only one not invited to the party? Everyone else is talking about it. You see their pictures, but you weren't there. I could go on. I mean, eating alone in a restaurant, I hate. I, I skip meals rather than eat alone because I'm convinced everyone is looking at me saying, look at that poor, sad loser eating all by himself. Or last person picked a recess. No one wanted you on their team. In grade school, that was me. Almost always the last one picks for kickball. I was a decent athlete, not that you have to be an athlete to play kickball. It's just nobody wanted me on their team. Those situations are horrible. You feel incredibly small and foolish. But for some people, it's more than a missed party, the wrong dress code, or being picked last. For you, that's what life feels like. Like you don't fit. You don't measure up. You don't have anything to offer. People, life, and situations have beat you down. And your opinion of yourself is at an all-time low. You don't think much of yourself and you assume no one else does either. There are a lot of reasons for a poor self-image. Give you a couple of them real fast. A poor picture of yourself emerges when uh, first you play the comparison game and you make the determination of your value and worth based on comparisons with others, you compare how you look, what you have, how much money you have, what you accomplish, you compare yourself to what you've decided the world sees as success. So you compare your looks to Instagram influencers who use tons of makeup, employ a professional hairstylist, and spend thousands of dollars on plastic surgery, and come on, they use filters and AI. You're not seeing the real person. Have you seen those pictures of stars without makeup? It's scary. You can bear your possessions, the rich and famous. If you just had the right car, the right brand of clothes, the big house, then you'd be successful. You can bear your bank account to Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. 
It's hard to measure out. On a more practical level, you compare your accomplishments to the people you went to high school or college with. He's president of the company, making big bucks. He's at the top, you're in the middle. She's living in the right neighborhood. You're stuck here. You compare your marriage or family situation to what you imagine others have. Look at them. He's married to a beautiful wife. Their kids are perfect. Their dog is perfect. They've got a perfect life, and I've got this. When you compare, your tendency is to magnify your own faults and minimize the faults of others. At the same time, you minimize your gifts, talents, and accomplishments, and you maximize the gift, talents, and accomplishments of others. And why is it that when you compare, you always seem to compare up? You compare yourself to the corporate CEO instead of the guy who can't get a job. You compare yourself to the person with the perfect life instead of the person with the ruined life. Just human nature. And when you compare, you lose. Your self-esteem also suffers when you play the if-only game. If only I would gotten married so young. If only I wouldn't have married him. If only I'd finished school. If only I'd taken that job. If only, if only, if only. When you dwell on the unchangeable past, it chips away your self-worth, your self-esteem. Low self-esteem occurs when you believe what others say about you. Maybe you grew up in a home where there wasn't really any praise or affirmation. Your childhood was filled with statements like, why can't you ever do anything right? Why do you always mess up? You're worthless. You'll never amount to anything. Your self-esteem is low because the most significant people in your life criticize you. For years, you were talked down to and criticized. Over time, you internalize it and believe it, and their words become your picture. Some of you have a poor picture of yourself because you suffered abuse. Manipulative abusers control their victims by tearing down their self-worth. The abuser wants you to believe it's your fault that you deserved it. And you decide there must be something wrong with me. Some of you finally suffer from poor self-worth because you confuse healthy self-worth with pride. Somewhere along the line, someone convinced you that to feel good about yourself is prideful. You've actually made it a spiritual value to see yourself as worthless. So you regularly engage in negative self-talk, cutting yourself down. Over time, you've said it so many times, it becomes who you are. You actually believe your own lies. Now, if your self-esteem and your self-worth is low, you know it. You want to change, but how? How? How do you lift your self-worth and your self-esteem and feel good about yourself? This is a big deal. This is a core issue for many of you. Your view of yourself affects every relationship in your life. You'll never be able to truly love and receive love until you first learn to love yourself as God created you to be. So I want to take a few minutes and I want to give you some thoughts on changing your self-picture. If you struggle with low self-worth, I want you to really tune in. Or if there's somebody in your circle, in your orbit, in your circle of influence that struggles with low self-worth, I'm going to teach you some ways to help them. So if you struggle, here's some ideas. Then we're going to finish with some great things that Scripture says about you. Number one, spend time with lifters and avoid downers. Downers are people who tear you down with their negative criticism, and they do that because of their own low self-esteem. Count on it. People who try to hurt others with their words think they're gonna make themselves feel better. And somehow they've deceived themselves into believing that if they make you feel worse, it'll make them feel better. And all they're doing is revealing their own issues. Avoid the downers, don't spend any time with them. Instead, spend time with lifters. Lifters make you feel better about yourself. They lift you with their words and their hugs and their love and the value they give you. They're not doing it to manipulate or to get something. They genuinely love and care. A lifter is comfortable enough in themselves and in God to demonstrate the love of Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean they ignore your faults. I said lifters, not enablers. But a lifter can love and make you feel important 
even as they address weakness. Say, so where do I find lifters? I put a a QR code in your bulletin. Join a connection class or a prayer group or a ministry. Form relationships. Church is a great place to find lifters. So how do you spot one? Lifters speak positively of others. Lifters speak encouragement to you. They find the good. Lifters are honest about their own weakness, which is what makes them patient with yours. Uh, Lifters have a gentle nature. I've never met a gentle critic. Not once. When you're done spending time with lifters, you feel better about yourself, about life, about the future. Number two, to lift your self-esteem, lift someone else. Be a lifter. The principle is when you lift someone, it lifts you. So let me show you how to be a lifter. If you want to have a lot of friends, if you want to absolutely revolutionize your relationships, this will be life-changing for you. Some of you have spent years finding fault and controlling others. I'm going to challenge you to change and show you how to do it. First, see people through God's eyes. When you see someone through the eyes of our loving Heavenly Father, it changes the way you speak to them, the way you treat them, the way you respond. To which you say, Pastor Rod, what about people who don't do right? Uh, What about irritating people that are hard to love? That was once us, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. Well, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. If God could love you while you were still a sinner, then I can love you through his eyes. I can love you in spite of your flaws. Downers see people through a grid. What can they do for me? What can I get out of this relationship? What's in it for me? Lifters approach it a completely different way. I love you because God loves you. God has a plan for your life, and I want to be a part of God's plan. Second, choose to see the good. There's good and bad in everyone and everything. Downers choose to see the good. Downers choose to see the bad. Lifters choose to see the good. You find what you're looking for. So instead of looking for what's wrong, look for what's right. Instead of focusing on mistakes, focus on success. See people in circumstances a different way. Then, this is huge. This, this is going to change your week. Don't just see the good. Say the good. Colossians 4, 6, be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best of others in a conversation, not to put them down or cut them out. Write a thank you note. Send an affirming email. Tell someone you love and appreciate them. When you do, you lift them up. You're not a downer. You're a lifter. Now, This is an area where people struggle, so I'm going to pull out for a moment and coach you on how to say the good. Because people think they're saying the good when they're completely not. So let me show you. First, don't qualify your compliments. Don't think you have to say a negative in order to make your positive better. Just say the positive. I can tell by the way you're looking at me. I need to give you some examples. Here's some good news. I've saved up some examples, real world things people have said. Hey, Pastor Rod, I haven't really liked all your sermons, but that one was really good. (laughs) Your negative just undid your positive. You are a downer, not a lifter. Well, everyone else may be criticizing you, but I think you did the right thing. Congratulations, even though there's a compliment in there somewhere, You are a downer. I heard this one. Wow, the music was great today, Pastor Tim. It's usually so loud I can barely stand it. That's not a compliment. Hey, honey, I sure like the dress, that dress better than the one you wore yesterday. That's not a compliment. It's also incredibly stupid. Students, some of you have heard this great report card. You should be able to do that every time. I expect it from now on. On no level is that encouraging, right? You just took a lifting opportunity and you made it a downer. Here's another one. Uh, You look great. 
How much more are you trying to lose? It's called a backhanded compliment that doesn't encourage anyone. I have one that's only a couple weeks old. Somebody came to me in the lobby, I won't call their name, and said, uh, boy, it's about time you preached a sermon like that. I really liked it. Okay, that wasn't a compliment. When you qualify the compliment, people only hear the negative. You brought them down. Just say something nice. You can say something nice without saying something mean at the same time. Then speak over someone what you believe they can become. The best lifters do this. Instead of speaking what someone is, speak what they can be. Let them hear words of faith and belief coming from the mouth of a lifter. Listen, they've got enough people telling them what's wrong, what they can't be and what they can't do. Don't join those voices. Speak what you believe and God desires them to become. Years ago, we had a guy in our church and he's gone now, so it's okay for me to tell the story. He was the most insecure person I've ever met. He was an unbelievable downer. And his, his way to start every conversation was cut down humor. Every conversation started with an insult. I still remember one day walking down that hall. He said, Pastor Rod. And I pretended like I didn't hear him. And I just kept walking because that's what you do to downers. Why would you purposely hear them? And so I took a few more steps. Pastor Rod. I had... Uh, just momentary deafness, and I didn't hear again. Then he ran. He actually chased me down to insult me. First words out of his mouth were another cut down. He thought that was funny. Everyone just thought he was an idiot. And so we had a meeting as a team. That's the only time I ever remember us having a meeting about one person. And we, we all talked about it and said, we're all going to do the same thing. When he does that, we're going to look at him and say, thanks, have a good day, and walk away. No laughs, no retaliation, nothing. We're going to give him no feedback. If he accidentally says something positive, we're going to go overboard. Man, thank you. You are such an encourager in my life. That means the world to me. Thank you for speaking wonderful, positive things. It just... After about three months of that, we had begun to retrain him. And every once in a while, he would accidentally start a conversation by saying something positive. It was amazing. We spoke over him what he could become. Listen, your kids, your students, they have enough people cutting them down and tearing them down. They need to hear you lifting them up. When they come to church, I'm, I'm going to lift them up. They're class pastors. They're going to lift them up. We're going to encourage them. Try doing the same. Just staying after them doesn't work. They need to hear words of belief and confidence and love. The most powerful words you can say to someone are, I love you. I believe in you. I believe in your potential. I believe God's going to use you. I believe you're a difference maker. Saying the good means even more at the right time. When's the right time to say encouraging words? Well, really, any time. But when you, when you know someone's tired, when you know someone's getting criticized, when they've done something that went well, when they've done something that didn't go well, when you see how hard they work, when you notice something no one else notices, when you sense the direction of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing to think about, but God can actually guide you in your timing. Right words at the right time can save someone's life. To be a lifter, dare to express love. Hug someone, send a note, tell them you love them. People need to hear, I love you, you matter to me. I thank God for you. Your lifting words will never be forgotten. Lifting words and lifting moments live forever. Years ago, teaching a middle school um, connection class, I had all the students put a piece of paper on their back, gave everybody a pen, and we wrote, we walked around and we wrote positive, encouraging words on their back. They couldn't see who wrote it. Anonymous, positive, encouraging words. Eight years later, 
I was in the room of one of those kids. She's now in college. And uh, her closet door was open. And I saw a tape to her closet door, that piece of paper with those positive words, eight years she'd saved that. What would a church look like where everyone was a lifter? Where everyone spoke encouraging words? What would it be like if when you came to church, you knew everyone was gonna lift you up? Oh, that's actually what we're commanded to do. This is not like, wouldn't that be cool if our church did this? The Bible tells us this is what we have to do. First Peter chapter three, let me just read it to you and I'll let you kind of grade yourself. Be agreeable. Be sympathetic. Be loving. Be compassionate. Be humble. That goes for all of you with no exceptions. I'm reading the Bible here. No retaliation, no sharp tongue sarcasm. Instead, bless. That's your job to bless. You'll be a blessing and you'll also get a blessing. When you lift others, they lift you and God lifts you. Here's the third thing to lift your self-esteem. Replace wrong thinking with the truth of God's word. And I just wanna run through some common thoughts. If you have low self-worth, if you've tuned me out, tune back in because I'll identify some of your thoughts and then I'm gonna answer those thoughts from God's word. Well, I can't do anything is right. Everything I do is a mistake, wrong. What's the truth? God designed you. Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Ephesians 2, 10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God designed and created you. And before you were born, God had a plan for you. You are the workmanship of God. You are his creation. God doesn't make mistakes. Wrong thought. I'm worthless. I'm not good for anything. Replace that thought with the truth of God's word. The value of something is determined by how much someone's willing to pay for it. I saw the other day that somebody paid like $10,000 for a Pokemon card. You say, well, a Pokemon card, it's just a worthless piece of cardboard. No, it's worth $10,000 because that's what someone paid for it. You, you can think your house is worth a million dollars. Here's how you find out if it is, if somebody will pay a million dollars. Whatever someone will pay for your house, that's what your health is worth. Your, your worth is determined by what God was willing to pay for you. And God paid a high price. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. What was the price? We turn over to 1 Peter 1, 18. For you know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. God loves you so much. You are worth the death of his son. Next time you find yourself questioning your worth, remember, your worth was determined on the cross. Say, but Pastor Rod, you don't know me. You don't know what I've done. God does. God saw what you would do and he still sent his son. You are worth that much. Next wrong thought, nobody cares about me. Nobody would even know if I was dead. Nobody cares. Wrong. God loves you. Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. You say, well, great. I'm worth more than a bunch of little birds. <laughs> no, God loves you so much and he values you so highly. He even knows how many hairs are on your head. I decided to try it. I love my grandson, Maverick. He's my buddy. And to prove how much I love him, I decided to count his hairs. I started counting. I gave up at 1,023. 
As much as I love Maverick, I can't do it. I can't count every hair on his head. God loves you so much that when you get a haircut, God adjusts the number. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. If you believe God's word is true, it's established. God loves you and cares for you. Wrong thought. I can't do anything right. I'm just a disaster waiting to happen. If I try it, it fails. I'm a loser. Here's the truth. God works through you. Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. The creator of the universe chooses you to accomplish his purpose. Not only can you do something right, you can do God's thing. Last wrong thought, I'm all alone. Pastor Rod, you say all those things. Fact remains, I'm all by myself. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. It's just me. Wrong thinking. You don't ever have to be alone because God desires relationship with you. God created you in his image so he could have intimate personal relationship with you. James tells us, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. If you have believed God, you are God's friend. God the creator of the universe, a powerful friend. If you struggle to feel alone, know this, God is with you. Now, if you struggle with low self-worth or self-esteem, this message is for you, but odds are you know you have low self-esteem and the fact I pointed it out makes you feel bad about yourself because you're not good enough to have good self-esteem. Seems like a never ending cycle. But this message is not intended to make you feel bad or to tell you to do better. Instead, I want you to know that God loves you and values you and wants to help you overcome this obstacle. He proved that at the cross. I want you to save the outline. And every time those thoughts come in, I want you to read what God says about you. His love for you was proved at the cross. Um, that's one reason we take communion. As you came in the door today, you were handed the elements of communion. If the ushers missed you, would you just raise your hand and keep it up? Hold it up and keep it up, and they'll get to you real quick. Boy, they didn't miss many. Great job, team. Communion is, uh, we do it, and in doing so, we remember Jesus' death. We remember the price he paid on the cross. But I want to teach you another way to think about communion. Communion, uh, we remember the price he paid. That's important because there is a price for sin. Jesus paid the price so you don't have to. And if you put your trust and your faith and your confidence in the price he paid, you're forgiven and you don't have to pay the price. But here's another way to think about it. Every time you take communion, I want you to remember how much God values you. Every time you take that little piece of bread and put it in your mouth that symbolizes his body, every time you take that little cup and you drink it that symbolizes his blood, I want you to remember just how much he values you, just how much he loves you, that Jesus died on a cross for you. That's what you are worth. Communion is not just, there's not like a rule. You can only take communion when you're at church. You can take communion at home. If, if you need to remind yourself, take some, of the, take some of the cups, take communion at home every day. And every time you do it, thank Jesus for his sacrifice and remember your value to him. He established that. Other people don't get to choose that. Jesus chose it when he died on a cross for you. So we're going to take communion together today. Jesus, thank you for your body that was broken for us. Thank you that uh, you suffered pain so you could identify with our pain. Thank you that you endured sorrow so you would understand ours. Thank you for the price you paid with your body. Jesus, thank you for your blood that was shed for us. 
Thank you that you died. You loved us enough to die for us. You didn't stay dead. Your death was proof of your love. When you came from the grave, you proved your power. You died for us because you loved us. And because you live again, you have the power to change us. Lord, I pray for people uh, who maybe have never put their faith and trust in the price you paid, that in the quietness of this moment, they would simply say, Lord, I accept the price you paid for me. Thank you for your love and your sacrifice. In Jesus' name. And let's eat the bread together. And then drink the juice. And would you bow your heads again? Because I want to pray for you one more time. I want to pray for you if you struggle with low self-worth. Maybe it's a, a framework for your life. It's something that you deal with constantly and you see its effect. Maybe it's not uh, your life frame, but it's something you struggle with uh, from time to time. Maybe it's, it's almost paralyzing how low it is. Maybe, maybe even uh, you've considered just ending your life because you feel worthless. I wanna pray for you. I haven't done this in the other services, but I just kind of sense to do it. And so this is gonna take a lot of trust on your part uh, to trust me that, that I would never embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. But if that's you and you struggle with that, would you just stand? Now, I understand that the nature of this is then you think, well, if I stand, other people are going to see me and then they're going to think worse and that can even push more at that. But would you just trust me? Because because I think the Lord really wants to do a work in you. And so let's let's take that risk together. And if this is a struggle, stand and we're going to pray for you. Okay, we're going to do it a little different this time than how we usually do. I want one person to stand with each person who's standing. And I want it to be someone that knows them. All right? Stand with them. Here's what we're going to do. If you'll allow them to, that person uh, for just a few moments is going to represent Jesus to you. They're going to reach out and grab your hand or they're going to uh, put their arm around you or wrap their arms around you and hug you. And we're, we're going to pray together. And they're going to pray for you and I'm going to pray for you. And we're going to pray that uh, your picture of yourself will change. Instead of seeing yourself through the eyes of other people or even through your eyes, that you'll see yourself through God's eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray for people who are standing in this room. I pray for people uh, watching online at home or in a hotel room or at work. Lord, I pray that the lies of the enemy would no longer have power in their life, but instead that they would accept the truth of your word. They would accept the value that you place on them. Lord, that, that you would continually speak words of value to them. I pray that you'd give them courage to change some relationships and to move some, some downers out of their life and add some lifters to their life, that they would begin to form relationship with healthy people who build them up and encourage and love them and care for them. And I pray, God, 
that you would change the way they see themselves, that they would no longer see themselves through the, the lens of their failure, through the words of critics, uh, through the words of abusers, but I pray that you would give a picture of themselves the way you see them. You look at them and you see them the way I see my grandchildren who I love and are perfect in my sight. You see them as your creation, as your child, as your friend, as the person you design and you have a plan and a purpose for. And I pray that they would see themselves the way you see them. Change our self picture, God. Change that view in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for people for whom this has been a, a really challenging struggle, even to the point of considering taking their own life. Give them today the hope and confidence that's found in relationship with you and being a friend of God. I pray every time those thoughts return, let them go back to your word and remind themselves again that you have determined their worth and their value. And we thank you for that. Jesus, thank you that the, when the world tears us down, you lift us up. Thank you that when the world says we're not good enough, that you have a plan and a purpose for us. Thank you that when the world tries to stop your plan, that your Holy Spirit comes along and pulls us to what you have for us. I pray, God, for your worth and value to be accepted by us. In Jesus' name, amen.